also sign up for public testimony on resolutions, reports, or the first readings of ordinances. In-person testimony may occur from one of several locations, including the City Council Chambers and the Lovejoy Room in City Hall and the Portland Building. Written testimony may be submitted at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer pre preserved order and decorum during city council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. All right, thank you very much. And we, we have a lot of background noise. And I'm not sure what's causing that. Could we make sure that we don't have any open mics and that people are remain, remain muted unless they're presenting? Um, and Megan, one possibility, do we have people in the overflow room this afternoon? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, can we make sure that mic is muted then from the overflow room? It looks like that one might still be open. Uh, with that then, our first item is a report, item number 457. Accept the Portland Design Commission 2021 State of the City Design Report. It's just so Commissioner Ryan. Yes. Hello, sorry about that. We had a really short break. It's National Brush Your Teeth Day, so I wanted to make sure that I did that before the meeting. Sorry, just wanted to add another proclamation. Um, I always want to thank my colleagues for joining me today for this report. It's such a pleasure to introduce the 2021 Portland Design Commission State of the City Design Report. And I want to begin by thanking this dedicated group of volunteers who serve on this commission. You all put in so many hours. And this commission meets, again, for many hours, two to three times a month to review land use cases and provide design advice, which we all, all my colleagues appreciate so much. So the dedicated group includes, um, well, we're all here, Sam Rodriguez is the chair, Chandra Robinson is the vice chair, Julie Livingston, Dan Vallister, is Dan here, and Jessica Molnilar, Zari Santer, Zari, and Brian McCarter. Anyway, so thank you all so much for your service. Today, the commission will be presenting their 10th report before the council. For those who don't know, the commission has been operating in the <coughs> city of Portland circa 1980, providing leadership and expertise on urban design and architecture, and on maintaining and enhancing Portland's historical and architectural heritage. The premise of this 2021 State of the City Design Report is how and why the design review matters in Portland, especially now. The Design Commission will present an overview of how design review has influenced the very fabric of our pedestrian-oriented city for the past 40 years. The Commission will also speak on how Portland has built a walkable, vibrant, diverse, and easily accessible central city that is admired by the world for its planning and design innovation. And lastly, the Design Commission will explain how, why now, more than ever, the application of design review's three design tenets, context, public realm, and quality and permanence are so critical to not losing livability for all who live, work, worship, and play in Portland. Today, I'm eager to hear more from the commission members and the interested members of the public who are with us today. Design Commission Chair Sam Rodriguez, will you please take it away and share the council, share with the council your Portland Design Commission 2021 State of the City Design Report. Take it away, Sam. Thank you so much, Commissioner Ryan. And uh, good afternoon, Mayor. And actually, sorry, Christina. Thank you, Christina. Um, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council and uh, 
Commissioner Ryan uh, did a great explanation. He already told uh, all who we are, but I'll tell you again with the way your Portland Development, I mean, Portland Design Commission. Uh, Vice Chair Chandra Robinson uh, is here today with, as well as um, Commissioner Sari Santner. Just, Jessica Molinar will not be able to attend today, but she, and neither will Julie Livingston. Don Ballister, Brian McCarter, and I, your chair, Sam, I mean, Sam, will be here to make the presentation on behalf of the whole commission. We're, we're a team and we work as a team. And I have to thank everybody in the commission for, for helping putting this together, particularly Brian McCarter, who did a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, new next slide, please. That's us. I should have said next slide before that. So um, and next slide, please, Christina. In spite, so in spite the lower case loads in 2021, uh, we have managed to keep quite busy with design assist, assist reviews, so DARs, land use reviews, LURs, as well as advisory role. Next slide, please. As you can see here, our, 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 our tools, as uh, Commissioner Ryan um, um, alluded to, are, uh, are the uh, design review guidelines, the citywide guidelines, and those are founded on three major tenants, which are, as, as he mentioned, context, uh, public realm and quality and permanence, as well as resilience. So next slide, please. In June, in June you, you, you'll probably look at this and think so it might remind you of something because you approved in June uh, as the citywide design guidelines, which apply to design overlay zones outside of the central city district. The new citywide design guidelines are great improvements over the original community design guidelines, simpler and more to the point. We also now have a two-track approval process, which is, uh, um, you know, uh, depicted in this uh, in this graph, in this graphic. Applicants can choose based on the particular of their projects to follow a cookbook approach, sort of more prescriptive approach, using finite design standards, or they can choose to go to uh, the design guidelines path which uh, comes to a base, uh, that's where we come in, right? By um, authority you grant us, we use discretion to go beyond the simple code requirements and find uh, really exceptional design solutions. Uh, now let us walk you through example projects uh, from this year that demonstrate how we use the guidelines. Um, so with that, I will give it to Chandra and I think the next slide, Christine. Thanks, thanks Sam. Um, my name is Shonda Robinson. I've been a commissioner since 2019. I'm going to talk a little bit about our context-related guidelines. The intent of the context guidelines is really to balance aspirations of the future desired character that's in the zoning code and the 2035 plan, along with what is happening in those neighborhoods today. And the guidelines are really sequenced to, scout, to telescope from the really big picture all the way down to very site-specific small details. Um, in this image, you'll see a project that's in a major new neighborhood emerging near Northwest 23rd and Raleigh. This is in the Slab Town area. And it's a new two block development that will extend all the way from the I-405 freeway ramps to a cherished landmark, the St. Patrick's Church. And through our discussions and our discretionary authority to grant modifications, we were able to create a larger courtyard and, a, and lower building setbacks near the church in exchange for an added floor on the west end of the block. We also encouraged different contrasting brick color to lighten the new building's mass next to the church. And um, if, you, if you look right here, I'm just gonna draw really quick. So this is the area we're talking about here and because it's right next to this church, what we asked them to do was kind of step it down in deference to the church, right? And in order to do, to do that, they uh, were able to build up one extra floor on this side, right? So it's a way to balance what's on one side, give preference and sort of focus on this really uh, specific place by modifying the rest of the building. So that's a good reason for us to be able to uh, do those modifications. If you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, so then thinking about um, in this next image, how that actually impacted what you see when you look down the street. So in the previous iteration, it did that over here, it steps down a little bit more so that it's a little bit lower than it was uh, in the first iteration. And it also impacted this building across the way. So it actually made it kind of match the rest of the neighborhood context. Instead of having a different form, it was still more rectilinear, right? Um, if you go to the next slide, 
This is a project that's along Powell Boulevard. And here new projects are beginning to really change the character of Powell from being a state highway to a civic corridor that's consistent with the 2035 plan. So this project is an affordable housing complex that evolved significantly through DARs, the design advice requests, to provide a better courtyard facing Powell, a better private courtyard for the residents on the back, and a new public pedestrian bicycle path through the site. So again, here, what we were looking at was sort of a smaller courtyard that turned into something much bigger that would impact what's happening on the street and create some kind of like a safe eddy for pedestrians where it's really busy, right? So the character of Powell is beginning to change and be more pedestrian friendly. Um, and next slide, please. And then looking at the elevation of this building where it has changed, that revised public courtyard that faces Powell is landscaped and surrounded by active ground floor spaces. And this frontage really defines a new pedestrian oriented identity for Powell Boulevard. And so again, you see right there, that's the space that has become more lush, it's deeper, it's more pedestrian friendly and creates a really nice space on Powell. Zeri? Oh, you're muted, Zeri. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. This is Zeri Santner. In the next few slides, I describe how the public ground design guidelines strengthen a building and site's relationship with the street right of ways and public open spaces. These guidelines are focused on ground floor uses, entry plaza and lobby, art and special features, and weather protection. For the same project on Powell Boulevard, as Chandra described, we encourage the design team to make sure that the active uses on the ground floor surround both the public entry plaza and the rear private courtyard where ch children will play to keep plenty of eyes on these spaces and to ensure the safety of the users. Next slide, please. A um, proposed, oh, I'm sorry. I think I already covered it, didn't I? Yes, next slide, sorry. Um, a proposed affordable housing project on East Burnside and 7th was first presented to us during a design advice request and included, uh, as you can see here on the left slide, slightly skewed building mass with dispersed retail spaces on the ground floor. We persuaded the applicant to simplify the building mass and include a, a comfortable covered arcade, which is a, an important and required design feature for buildings on East Burnside within the East Side um, central east side industrial district. Next slide, please. As a result, the final approved uh, design included the covered arcade and focused the retail spaces along Burnside, as well as providing a protected internal courtyard for residents. Next slide, please. On another project, we work with the Modera main design team to pr provide street facing patio porches for ground floor residential units and um, also publicly accessible gardens and water features along 20th Avenue, all to enhance and harmonize with the successfully and success successfully blend into the Boots Hollow Neighborhood Association. Um, with next slide, I will uh, hand over the presentation to the next commissioner. Yeah, this is Don Vallister. I'm talking about quality and res resilience related guidelines that underscore holistic site and building designs that benefit people and climate. A new hotel on the North Park Plex came to us first with an L-shaped mass and painted stucco exterior. We urge the design team to explore other options for the second DAR. Next slide, please. 
the, uh, the mass was improved to an H design enclosing a pleasant courtyard. The final approved design features, which you have in the slide in front of you, include an all brick facade, simplified windows and cornices, and an elegant entry courtyard that faced the future green loop. Next slide. At Moderna, Maine, and Goose Hollow, we work with the applicant to simplify the elevations and mix of materials for the tower and podium. And that made for, as you see on the right, a more coherent overall design. Uh, Brian, you're next. Yes, next slide, please. This is Commissioner uh, Brian McCarter. We are also um, had some um, interesting des design advisory roles over the year, which, over the last year, which allow us to work with our partner agencies uh, like PBOT, um, Bureau of Environmental Services, and, and others. And one of those things is, is, as you guys are probably aware, the um, there's a coming wave of 4G, 5G small cell infrastructure coming all over the country by mandate from uh, FCC. And cities don't have a choice to incorporate this or not. They have to. And what's been going on in a lot of other cities you can see on the left is there's some fairly crude adaptations of existing Cobra streetlights, which look like they have suitcases or other apparatus just bolted onto them. Um, true to Portland spirit, we, we rolled up our sleeves with PBOT and our partners there and a, and a design team and a light pole manufacturer and really sought to, if we're gonna put these things on our downtown streets, they should look like they have a, a better affinity with our existing street lights, which you can see off to the right. So we work with them to take all of that equipment and hide it within uh, shrouds in the base, with a, within a shroud at the top, and to employ a contemporary version of the twin luminaires and really set it at a similar height. So when we see these things begin to roll out over the next few years, there won't be this kind of jarring uh, thing that you see happening here from other cities on the left. It'll be more integrated. Next slide, please. We also had a great uh, working session over the last year with Multnomah County and their bridge design team and uh, hand in hand with the Landmarks Commission to really look at this replacement project for the Burnside Bridge and the early structural types for that replacement on the left here, which kind of looked at twin symmetrical structures with a vertical lift span in the center. And we were able to encourage that design team to simplify because the context on the east side running over I-5 and the railroad yards is very different than the context on the west side, which goes over Waterfront Park and the Old Town Chinatown neighborhood. So that appears to be heading in a very good direction. Next slide, please. Another effort that we uh, rolled up our sleeves with with PBOT is this is this idea or this condition that we find ourselves in sometimes where a new building is proposed in a predominantly historic resources neighborhood, which has an established you know, building line where all the buildings like on First Avenue kind of line up in a formal relationship. And Peabot is interested um, and throughout the city usually um, looks for setbacks to require uh, wider sidewalks uh, as our city has grown. However, that puts oftentimes the new building in a very jarring relationship with, with the old one. So working with PBOT, they were able to develop um, some flexible new standards for when you can have some relief from some of those standards to better blend into the neighborhood. Next slide, please. So you're probably thinking as we were, how is this all relevant to the problems Portland is facing now, particularly downtown? And we thought it was instructive to maybe look back over the over the kind of development of Portland and take a longer view because downtown has had some very difficult periods before. We started out in our first 80 years in Portland creating a very compact, walkable, lively city with weather protection, lots of ground floor transparency, and really pretty consistent architecture. Next slide. But after World War II, uh, all kinds of things changed. We began tearing historic building downs buildings down, we began running highways through neighborhoods along our waterfront, and we really, really lost our way. Next slide, please. And we also became an air quality non-attainment area. And for those of you who remember this period, um, 
we were under threat of losing all federal transportation dollars if Portland didn't come up with a plan to reduce automobile, automobile trips and to clean up its air quality. And at that time, we really, I mean, more or less abandoned transit. We didn't really have viable uh, transit and we didn't have a high modal share of trips coming downtown. Next slide, please. And when we did build new buildings during this era, we really forgot how to make um, buildings that are friendly and inviting at street level. And instead we built these fortresses. And I think, next slide, please. I think all of this kind of came to a crescendo and public and private leadership in the city in the early seventies came together and knew that we couldn't continue these, uh, these trends or we're gonna lose downtown. And so out of that grew this diagram in the center of the 1972 downtown plan. And from that plan, a series of major public investments, Waterfront Park, Pioneer Square, the Transom Mall, and a series of other projects began to roll out over the next few decades. And we really began to change the course of downtown and make it into this, the world-class city it is today. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna turn it over to Sam. You're muted, Sam. Thank you for the reminder. I can't believe it. Two and a half years later, we're still doing this. Um, I still can't remember to unmute myself. Uh, so thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. And and we and, and as part of that, we instituted or the city instituted design review and design guidelines. For 40 years, Design Commission and BDS have guided Portland's development to uh, this to the world class city it is today. As the city regains its footing and the plywood comes down. We want to continue inv in investment and development in our city through the tradition of great design. Next slide, please. A topic that slowly emerged over the last year was how are we, how are the newly adopted zoning codes and new design standards approved pro approval process affecting the quality of the development? A small number of projects we reviewed reflected larger development projects trying to squeeze into sites that may be too small to accommodate good outdoor open areas for residents and the public. We'd like, we'd, we'd like to keep a close eye on what questions over the next year, uh, on that question over the next year and have a discussion with you about this in our state of the city next year. Again, you know, these things need to be tested in the real world. And then once we get those tests, we think we need to come back and probably maybe do some readjustments. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Commissioner McCarter and uh, Brian touched on how we lost our way in the 50s and 60s, how we created parking lots, pollution, and later fortresses in our central city, and how the application of our cutting edge city, and how the application of our cutting edge city planning with design review as an implementation tool revitalized the core and transformed it into a walkable, pedestrian friendly environment, truly an, envy, an enviable city in, in a lot of. Uh, we, compared to a lot of our peers, uh, which, you know, we've, we've kind of fallen from that pedestal for a little bit. A desirable place to, and, and, and because we were such a desirable place to live. We're now seeing the preponderance of housing as new projects where affordable, whether affordable or market rate projects, new residents and those already living around the sites deserve a high quality of built, of built environment in each new project. We are at a crossroads uh, we, with new problems, and we believe that the new planning and design process and design review process will be a catalyst for a newly invigorated Portland. There are many <clears throat> problems that have, we have to tackle with expediency and urgency. Design review is not one of them. Design review is the all important long game. I mean, we have to think design is, is Good design will yield its fruits in the future, so we really have to keep on keep on going the course. Design review also provides a forum for existing neighbors to participate in the design discussion. We believe this is critical, and this is sort of paramount to Portland's ethos. We are committed to ensuring uh, we are committed to in ensuring that happens by upholding the tradition of design review in Portland, which is the mandate you gave us. So thank you, um, and that's um, so. That's the that's the last slide. Uh, I think um, Tim can help me out here because I don't have the agenda in front of me. Ne next think. next slide, and then the next slide after that. Okay, got it. So you do have it in the slides. Okay, just so next slide. 
our commission, yeah. There should be one more slide. There you go. Oh, okay. So that, sorry, I, I got confused. It's that last slide, uh, Christina, so sorry. All the way to the end. Yeah. So, you know, we traditionally every year we select a, uh, we select a, a winner, an award for some of the best designs that we saw. And our commission selected 3000 Southeast PAL as our project of the year. This new affordable housing complex not only exceeds our citywide design guidelines in all three tenants, but uh, we believe it also begins a critical transformation of one of Portland's historic arterials that is searching for a new identity. It, in, in, in that light, we believe this project could be catalytic. Congratulations to Patrick Breyer home of, with Home Forward, Host Architecture and their design team uh, for this. I, I, I know that they're in, in the, I think I saw, I thought I saw them in the room. Uh, there they are. So they, that's Dave Ott and the, and the design team. So uh, congratulations, guys. I mean, thank you. And um, thank you for all your hard work this year. So um, I think that we have some testimony too from the public. All right, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, before we go to public testimony, colleagues, any questions at this point? Otherwise we'll go to public testimony. Megan, uh, how many folks do we have signed up? No one signed up for this item. I'm sorry? No one signed up. Oh, okay. Was there invited testimony? Uh, uh, Mayor Wehrler, this is Tim Heron, uh, BDS Design Commission Liaison. Yes, there were. There are two invited testifiers. All right, um, why don't you go ahead and team up for us? Okay, um, I believe uh, Reza Farhudi was, we had signed up first, and then it would be Janet. I see you both. Good, welcome. Hello, welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of City Council, and members of the Design Commission. My name is Reza Farhudi, and I'm the co-chair of the Pearl District Neighborhood Association's Planning and Transportation Committee, a position which, which I've held for five years. Um, while I focus personally more closely on transportation issues um, than what is in the Design Commission's purview, our committee has had a good working relationship during that time. Uh, myself, along with my co-chair, David Dysert, have testified in front of the Design Commission numerous times. And I'm pleased to say that we've worked constructively with the commission in using the Central City and River District uh, functional design guidelines to make the projects in our neighborhood, if not always perfect, and at least better than what was originally proposed. Um, while we focus on issues of architectural design, mass and materials to create contextual buildings, we also focus on how projects can activate the streetscape to improve the public realm. And the Design Commission has proven to be a reliable partner in support of our goals for a more vibrant and mixed use urban neighborhood over the years. Examples of, of these projects include the Hampton Inn on Northwest Everett, the NV building on Northwest Overton, the Cambria Hotel, as you just saw on the park box, and the Hyatt Place on Northwest Flanders. Um, perhaps the most successful example of collaboration with the Design Commission was the Heartline building, which overcame significant neighbor opposition and ended up with an elegant low-rise brick building on the west side of the block to respect the adjacent 13th Avenue Historic District, while combining with a modern mid-rise residential building on the east side along 12th Avenue. Uh, finally, I just wanted to call out the Commission's leadership during the recent design advice request for the affordable housing project at the Hollywood Transit Center. Um, I intended as a member of the public mostly to comment on the substandard, substandard accommodations for the bike ped crossing of I-84 at the Transit Center and the poorly designed open space, which is not well set up for um, activation. Um, this was due to an arcane boundary for the difficult development areas, which bisects the site. Um, this boundary uh, follows zip code boundaries and is set by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, and it created an awkward L shape for the building to fit within this boundary. And I was very relieved when several commissioners called out these very issues. And I believe they were at least in part responsible for getting the applicant to um, revisit the boundary with HUD. And we might be getting a more sensible project um, that recognizes the importance of that crossing for the regional active transportation network. Uh, one that is clearly today inadequate for um, today's needs, um, let alone for the future. So as our neighborhood and central city continues to grow and change, we look uh, continue we look forward to continuing working our uh, with the design commission on this very productive relationship. Thank you very much for your time. I think I'm up next. Shall I go, Tim? Yes. Um, 
Mayor, City Council, and Design Commissioners. I'm Janet Bebb, uh, 1316 Southeast 50th Avenue, Portland 97215. I've been a resident for 25 years and have a keen interest in the public realm. Over the past four years, I've had the privilege of working with Albino Vision Trust and talking with residents, especially black residents, about what's important in our community. I heard a lot about belonging. I can walk with ease and without feeling threatened. My children are safe and can enjoy community spaces. Our elders are present and part of the theater of community they call home. The quality of architecture makes me proud. And this last one was stated repeatedly over and over again in public workshops. These characteristics are all interrelated and to some extent interdependent, a place where the surrounding area or context is harmonious and welcoming also enhances the potential for a positive public realm and the quality of the architecture complements both these attributes. Certainly these principles have long been held as important by Portlanders, but if we think they automatically happen, we're sadly deluded. It takes work and intelligence to stitch together a positive urban fabric from individual projects that often have a profit motive uppermost in priority. If you think about the places in Portland we love, many of them have buildings or parks that have been in place for 100 years. And despite all the challenges we face at this moment in time, we're still building for a solid future. The Design Commission safeguards these priorities, and I thank them for volunteering their valuable time. As we build, especially large projects that make a strong impact on the city, such as Albina, my hope is that the residents will feel the highest design quality is equally available for everyone and that our architecture and public realm continue to be a source of belonging and pride. Thank you. Thank you. And Megan, if I understood you correctly, there is no public testimony. Is that correct? That's correct. Very good. So uh, Commissioner Ryan, does that complete the presentation? Yes, it does. We can Very good take questions. Yeah. Unless uh, Commissioner Hardesty has a question. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Ryan. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Design Commission, for that impressive uh, presentation. Um, you know, we, we hear constantly about the barriers that we put in place to create housing uh, in this community. And there's always this push and pull between doing it quick and doing it well. Um, and I am so grateful for the amount of time each of you volunteer uh, to ensure that regardless of the economic status of the residents who will reside, that you share my value, which is everyone deserves a safe, comfortable, nice place to call home. And your income should not determine whether or not you have the ability to do that. Um, I am always impressed with how you always make the design better. I keep asking people, give me one example where the design commission actually did the opposite. And in my time here on council, that has never happened. Um, it is a credit to uh, you, Sam, uh, uh, Chandra, Julia, Zarier, uh, Jessica, Brian, and Don, um, that we continue to have these high quality projects um, that really are improved because you care passionately about the people who will thrive in those environments. So uh, just a great deal of respect and appreciation uh, for all your volunteer time. Thank you. I, I guess there was not a question in there, uh, what it was, was a great deal of appreciation for all the hours you spend, um, really trying to help make sure that for the generations to come, uh, people will be proud of the community they live in. So thank you. Thank you very good, Commissioner uh, Hardesty. Thank you. And if there's no other questions, I'll entertain a motion, Commissioner. So move. Commissioner Ryan moves. Commissioner Hardesty seconds. Any further discussion? Please call the roll. Ryan. Thank you so much, uh, commissioners. That was such a great report. The, it's always about the little things, and as Commissioner Hardesty said, you always make every design better. I was really uh, taken with uh, the design of the St. Patrick's Church neighborhood. That was a, that was great um, detail that you brought to our attention. 
<clears throat> gave everybody a good example of the hard work that you do as uh, volunteers. So I just really am here to say I'm delighted to um, uh, be here for this presentation. I was also uh, noting that the the project on PAL, the 3030 project, was won the award. I got to just uh, let the contractor know that, and they were they didn't know. So um, this just in, um, you made the people at Colas Construction quite happy. Um, so thank you very much for your good work, and um, I vote aye. Hardesty. I've already made my remarks. I am very happy to vote aye. Thank you. Maps. Um, I want to thank the Design Commission for their thoughtful work over the past year. Um, and the time I've been on council, I've come forward to, I've come to look forward to this day. Uh, um, literally every time I review your uh, um, state of the city design report, I literally see the city differently. Um, and I also see the profound and positive impact you have on our city. Um, I also want to call out and recognize just the really innovative and interesting um, uh, work you're doing on the 4G, 5G uh, um, infrastructure redesign. That's just super neat. I wouldn't even have known who was responsible for that or even what those things were uh, if it weren't for uh, um, this presentation today. So I encourage you to keep it up. Um, and I'd also like to congratulate Home Forward and Commissioner Ryan for the good design embodied in 3000 Powell. Um, um, I've watched this project uh, evolve over the last 17 months. It's great that it's looking great. And I want to thank everyone who helped to get it. Uh, um, who helped make it good. Uh, and for these reasons and more, I'm happy to vote aye. Rubio. Um, thank you, Commissioner Ryan and design commissioners and the design commission staff um, for uh, this presentation and your thorough uh, work on this report. The presentation really gave us a sense of the creative and nuanced and thoughtful work that you do. And it's it's been especially helpful to see the original design compared to the end product and, and all the influence that you had there. Um, and it makes your contribution to this work even more impressive than it already is. So um, also very consistently impressed by the high quality of work, as my colleagues mentioned, um, that consistently comes from your work on the commission and especially as volunteers. Um, and I also just want to appreciate uh, your close work with um, our planning and sustainability commissioners as well. So we're just very appreciative of your service and um, really, really um, appreciate this, um, this great presentation. I vote aye. Wheeler. Yeah, this is great work and the presentation I think highlights the tremendous effort. I just want to also acknowledge, you know, this is a group of engaged citizens. You don't get paid for this work. There's a lot of detail involved. This is a critical path effort as far as development goes while at the same time balancing development pressures with the need to make sure that uh, the buildings that we're building are buildings that, that we can be proud of for generations to come. And I find the work product to be exemplary. And uh, I'm just grateful to each and every one of you for your fantastic service. Thank you. I vote aye. And the report is accepted. Thanks and keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is our last item for this afternoon, actually, 458, and it's also a report. Mayor, this is a time certain at 3 p.m. Ah, so it is. Thank you for reminding me. We'll be in recess then until 3 p.m. That gives everybody a chance to go eat your lunch finally. Uh, we are in recess till 3 p.m. Recording. Recording.
progress. Megan, could you please read our remaining item, item number 458. Except the Portland Historic Landmarks Commission 2021 State of the City Preservation Report. Commissioner Ryan. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan isn't back yet. Oh, all right. Well, we'll wait a minute. Good practice, though. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here today. We're looking forward to this report. Thank you. Good afternoon. Now, here's a term I didn't think I'd hear again, unreinforced masonry buildings. Oh, no, I, too soon, too soon. Come so on, man, we can laugh about it now. Not, not very hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's an inside joke for the rest of you, but. <laughs> yeah, the good old days, right? Lessons learned, so many in such little time. Does anyone know where Commissioner Ryan is? <sighs> Commissioner Rubio, are you on? Commissioner Rubio is absent for the rest of the day. Oh, she is absent for the rest of the day. Okay, very well. Uh, let me ping Dan here. One moment, I'm going to go on to me. It's been a long day for all of us. Uh, we had, I think, a 15 minute lunch break. And uh, so, uh, but you know, that's why they pay us the big bucks so that we can power through these days. <laughs> Thanks, Commissioner. <laughs> totally fine. Do you have anybody from Commissioner Ryan's staff on? I'm sure he wouldn't mind if we just started with the- why, why don't we do that? He probably got tied up on a phone call or something. So why don't we go ahead? And I, I don't have the introduction, but uh, maybe one of you could just jump in and sort of uh, lead us off, and then when Commissioner Ryan's able to join us, we'll we'll let him uh, give some introductory remarks. Kristen, do you want to lead us off? Sure, I can do yeah. that. Would you Would you like me to start my presentation? And uh, yeah, let's let's go ahead and just jump in. That'd be terrific. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, now, is the council clerk going to run it the same as the design commission, or do you want me to share my screen? Megan, what's your preference? We're prepared for either. Kristen, do you have a preference? Um, might be easiest if you go ahead. Great, we'll pull that right up. Thank you. Um, while we're waiting for that to start, oh yeah, she's getting it right up. I'm, right. I'm Kristen Miner, I'm the chair of the Landmarks Commission. Um, and I think we can just go ahead and start with the next slide. There we are. Um, we are currently um, only five members strong, um, but we have been interviewing to fill the two empty seats. Um, so I'll go ahead and do some introductions. You can see those uh, faces along the bottom, but today's presentation will be, will include commissioners Andrew Smith, Kimberly Moreland, me and Ernestina Fuenmayor, who just stepped down after completing a full term. And I also would like to recognize along the bottom here, um, the vice chair, Maya Fodi, and uh, Matthew Roman, who has been on the commission about as long as I have, and who is here today as well. Um, I also want to recognize and thank uh, Hillary Adam and Cara Fioravanti um, at BDS who help us through 
every proceeding. And also Brandon Spencer Hartle at BPS, who achieves an astounding amount um, for basically a one man department as he is. Um, we are, of course, unpaid volunteers appointed by the mayor. And for an idea about our scope of work, we, we do have a very broad scope of work. And some of those items include land use cases, very similar to the design commission that you just heard, as well as design advice, uh, legislative advice, and we work with historic districts and provide advocacy and collaboration with other commissioners and agencies. Next slide. Over the last year, the, the, the truly big deal in our, in our world of preservation has been the adoption of a new historic um, resources code. That it, and that project took over several years. So I wanna thank the mayor and the city council for prioritizing and funding that work. And a few highlights that have come out of that project um, especially for us, include some new processes for survey and designation as a local city process. So, you know, it doesn't mean the National Register is not important, but it gives really needed options. There are also more allowances in the code, um, which we generally view as kind of adaptive reuse for, for neighborhoods, if you will. Um, let's see, there are true protections for resources in conservation districts that we didn't have before. And then finally, uh, some really great incentives to keep and retrofit buildings. So, you know, I'm not gonna lie, we need more incentives, but providing use flexibility and eliminating things like parking requirements are an excellent start. Uh, next slide. Our, our themes and our focus over the last handful of years um, have always included preservation equity or preservation justice, if you will. And this continues to be our major push and our greatest challenge. Um, I, I will remind the council that the Bureau of Planning at one time was funded to survey, create local conservation districts, and do community outreach. You can see at the top of the slide, Comprehensive Plan Policy 4.53 reads, expand historic resources, inventories, regulations, and programs to encourage historic preservation in areas and in communities that have not benefited from past historic preservation efforts. So we continue to really focus on that work. Uh, we would like to see commitment again to recognizing more diverse histories and making preservation relevant to all groups. We also cannot lose sight of the need to reuse and, and improve what we have and not tear it down. And that's really the secondary focus here of sustainability and resilience. Next slide. And this cues up Commissioner Moreland. Good afternoon, everyone. So nice to see you. Um, Today, um, I would just like to kind of emphasize what Christian just mentioned, that a uh, major priority is preservation justice. Um, preservation justice also restores the re erasure of culture, and especially those of um, African Americans in Portland and other people of color. Um, the, this map um, demonstrates how gentrification and displacement and Portland also threatens historic resources, particularly resources that represent marginalized communities. Um, there's a kind of a direct correlation when you remove uh, and displace people, you also threaten historic resources um, due to new, new development. 
And oftentimes, because historic resources that are um, significant to African Americans and other people of color are relatively unknown, a lot of those resources are, are demolished. And so th this map um, just shows you that the yellow indicates the kind of early stages. Brown is where there's um, dynamic changes happening and blue and purple colors are the continual loss. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Um, the Portland Historic Resource Inventory is 40 years old. Um, and at the, map in, uh, at the map indicated, we are losing many of the resources that was inventoried. Some property was never even considered. Um, historic preservation movement towards honoring and preserving buildings with cultural significance will add new building to um, an updated uh, historic resource inventory. And so the commission would love um, for the Portland um, the City Council to fund um, an updated historic resource inventory. And we see this as a, uh, as a step towards correct, correcting past injustice of the past while ensuring that all cultural heritage is considered. Funding uh, more projects um, like the, uh, his, the updated historic resources can model um, some of our older efforts like the Cornerstone of Community that uh, provided our inventory of sites related to African Americans. And this model can be replicated in other communities of color. Um, next slide, please. Um, we applaud the city of Portland for funding the recently <clears throat> approved nominations related to the I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty had a question. Oh, I'm fine. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I'm sorry to interrupt your flow, but could we go back one slide, please? Was the old Albina neighborhood, the gentrification map? Yeah, this one. Thank you. Um, so I am curious if you've given any thought to what would be different with this map if the Albina Vision Trust vision became a reality? Is there a proactive thing that could happen that could actually change the color of this map significantly? I, um, Christine, would you like me to answer that? Because I, I am going to talk about that. Oh, okay. I, I, I can wait. I may be jumping ahead, but it I, I'm intrigued by the opportunity that that vision creates. Um, and if there's a way to undo past harm, if in fact that vision is realized. Yes, it is. And I talk about that when I talk about non-traditional methods of historic preservation. And so we'll touch on that shortly. Then I'll wait. Thank you. Okay. There we go. Um, so um, we really do appreciate um, the city of Portland for funding the recently approved nominations related to African-American history and the multiple property documentation form that made these individual nominations possible. We look forward to seeing more property places and events representing histories that have been less heard or, or celebrated because these individual acts on part of the city government help to um, create a more just equitable system. Um, and while traditional approaches work, there are some non-traditional approaches like as Joanne, as Commissioner Hardesty mentioned, um, the Albina Vision Trust, which will restore, reclaim, repurpose sites, um, and even uh, some of the non traditional approaches to help uh, uh, historic preservation, such as, a, such as a, a monument plan that memorialize individuals and places that are important to African Americans. And um, there are a few sites within their boundaries that are, um, can use the traditional method of, of um, preserving the building because of their cultural significance and architectural significance. But it's really exciting that we're in this moment in time where people are reimagining historic preservation. And, um, and it allows um, 
people of color and property owners of color to utilize some of the traditional benefits and resources such as the Billy Webb Elk Lodge, who's now in a position to use some of those federal funds and to restore the um, damage, fire damaged buildings. And um, next slide, please. And one of the, um, I'm involved in a historic property state work group that's sponsored by Bobby Levy and Representative Andrea um, Falarama. And we're in a, we're gathering together to create a new provision for, for the special assessment of historic property. Um, and this program is typically used by um, wealthy white men who um, developers um, and who, um, use the program to um, freeze the tax base for 10 years. And upon rehabbing a building, oftentimes on, in main streets. And while they did help restore and revitalize main street developments, that program didn't have a lot of, of outreach only to um, you know, wealthy developers and um, wealthy homeowners. Um, and so this group is working together to streamline and reduce some of the financial burden so that others can participate. Um, Representative Valorama has a, a very intentional about creating some anti-displacement tools and methods. And, she, and the group is working together to broaden their reach and to benefit everybody, particularly um, marginalized groups. And so um, they were successful in extending the, the sunset date for this um, bill so that the group could have more time to really look at some of the ways to create perhaps a three-tier model that looks at income, property taxes, and a direct um, grant program for homeowners. And so we're really excited about what's happening here. And so, um, um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm so glad to be a part of that as well as um, being participating in some of the nominations that were funded by the city of Portland. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Commissioner um, Ernestina. Thank you. Next slide, please. Oh, that's not my slide. I wasn't quite sure if, um, if I was supposed to, but I could I could speak to this one as yes, well. Um, these are just examples of some of the ways that we can create a cultural resource plan and a preservation plan that will preserve Bamport and other um, um, uh, homes and residents that have significance to um, people of color. And um, the a cultural resource plan will set measurable action items and accountability. Um, they would have outreach will be at the center of the, the, the cultural resource plan. And there would be an intentionality to include underrepresented groups. And the priority will focus on restorative justice, whether through a combination, uh, whether through traditional preservation or new methods. And one of the things I always say is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because sometimes we want to get rid of a tool, but it, it's not really the tool. It's just that it hasn't been open and accessible to everybody. And so, but in the meantime, we need to combine that with new methods. And I, I'm Commissioner Hardy speak. Uh, thank you. Uh, and who is the who that would develop the cultural resource plan? That's a great question, and I, I believe it's the uh, City of Portland Historic Resource Department working with um, nonprofit groups like the Architecture uh, Architecture um, Heritage um, Center, the Bosco Miller Foundation. But I can have when a Commissioner Minor, do you want to address that? Sure, I'll just add a little bit. I think Commissioner Moreland is absolutely right. It probably would be spearheaded by the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Yeah, I yeah, I I I, I don't want to like come 
compartmentalize it because as I think about the opportunities on 82nd Avenue to preserve some cultural historic uh, 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 community norms, um, I, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I get concerned when we have a, we recommend a plan without a plan to actually do the plan so that we can actually have some outcomes from it. So I, I think I will talk to Commissioner Rubio and Commissioner Ryan about like, it, it's a great idea. The question is what happens after we accept your report? Thank you for your feedback. And so now I will turn it over to Commissioner Phil Meyer. <laughs> Thank you. And um, uh, I wanted to continue the excitement that we have that preservation is changing uh, and i'm really as a commission and as a, a preservation group uh, we are really excited for these changes since uh, the past years have shaken white american society and has forced awareness on how minorities have contributed to the growth of this country uh, we see these changes are having really a positive effect in the preservation movement across the country it's not just here Preservation was always related to big, elegant, elegant, expensive houses or buildings. And however, the society is now understanding that we really need to preserve beyond the buildings. We need to preserve cultures. Um, we need to see what less privileged group have built and contributed and preserved their cultures, our culture, their cultures. Um, the preservation movement is um, understanding these changes and as uh, uh, Commissioner Moreland expressed, there are uh, different uh, techniques that have been using now for preserving uh, historic resources. Um, we are also kind of giving less importance to the physical aspect of the preservation and more intangible features are identifying this, our, identified our cultures. Um, over the years, as uh, Commissioner Moreland expressed, uh, there have been many benefits uh, having buildings listed, uh, listed buildings and districts listed in the National Register, including tax credits, federal and state, state level, a special assessment program, and other economic benefits. But the only communities that have benefited from them have been white folks, and because the underrepresented groups lived in areas that had not been surveyed or have been overlooked by the city and limiting their access to this economic benefits. And if we re, re, we can um, remember that map that uh, Commissioner Moreland showed, we could see the HRI map, the first part was concentrated in the central part of Poland and the other area where all the uh, 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 risk and gentrification is happening. It is where the non-HRI has been really a non any survey of historic building has happened. Um, and um, please, next slide. So um, by supporting these communities and preserving their cultures, we contribute to a healthier society. We help them feel rooted, maintain a connection with their traditions, support future generations to learn where they come from. But this process has to start with an with uh, economic peace of mind. Um, in our report, we propose for second year in a row the creation of the legacy business program that could benefit long-term businesses that had closed had closed their doors uh, in this past year. Uh, this program can be implemented in three phases. Uh, phase one will be an inventory of businesses by a self-registering process. Uh, for those that comply the criteria that would have been established. And then phase two, that then when we identified funding sources, uh, will be a bond measure, it could be city budget, grants, et cetera. And then what phase three will be an implementation within a pilot program with five businesses. Um, we really think that um, this program can provide a boost to the morale and the finances of the underrepresented communities and we will see more of these long-term businesses remain open. And I will pass it on to uh, Commissioner Andrew Smith. Thank you, Ernestina. Um, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I get the pleasure of talking about the Thompson Elk Fountain today. Um, 
and I, I guess I want to start by thanking uh, this council uh, for uh, your recent um, resolution uh, committing to re restoring the, the Thompson Elk Fountain um, to its original location and uh, withdrawing the demolition delay. Um, that is certainly in line with um, this, this, the Landmarks Commission's um, recommendations that we made last fall uh, when we received a briefing about the Thompson Elk Fountain um, uh, from the uh, city arts uh, manager. Um, admittedly, the process could have gone better. Um, I think, um, you know, the there was a lot of there was a lot of public outcry because I think people in Portland really identify with the Thompson Elk Fountain. They 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 see it as as being an integral part of the city. So um, it was probably a bit of a painful process, uh, I imagine, and it's certainly a complicated one. Um, but uh, I think I can speak for for everyone on this commission uh, in saying that, from our perspective, um, this is it was a very successful outcome. Um, and I just I think I want to take um, this moment to um, just emphasize that our commission is really a diverse and knowledgeable one, and um, we encourage city council to use us uh, use us as a resource. We are here we're here to serve uh, the city, so please do continue to use us. Next slide. Um, so circling back to the sustainability and resilience topic. Um, uh, as you all know, the, the URM policy committee uh, that was formed in 2019 um, and on which uh, Vice Chair uh, Maya Fodi and I um, volunteered to serve was disbanded uh, in, in the wake of um, the COVID pandemic and uh, the, the social unrest that was taking place during, uh, during 2020. Um, that doesn't change the fact that these 1600 plus uh, URMs throughout the city um, still pose a significant risk to their, to their occupants and their users. And so I think one of the things that the Landmarks Commission would like to hear some commentary on um, and I think Commissioner Hardesty, it sounds like you volunteered to provide that at the top of the hour. Um, uh, just any any plans to resume that committee? Any 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 direction that's that's brewing about um, what what the city does intend uh, um, going forward re related to to URMs? Uh, next slide. So sticking with the uh, resilience. Um, topic. Uh, the um, I want to talk a little bit about the the earthquake ready Burnside Bridge project. And as you all know, um, the Burnside Bridge is a historic landmark. And as a as a commission, we cert we don't take um, any uh, prospective demolition of a historic landmark lightly by any means. Um, at the same time we recognize that there is a great public good that can be done um, by the replacement of the bridge. So uh, it's, it, it, it's a, puts a, it, it's a tenuous, uh, I think, topic for us as a commission, but one that we certainly understand the reasoning behind the project. So uh, I think it was uh, March, in March of 2021, I can't believe it's been more than a year ago now, um, the um, the design commission and the landmarks commission held a joint uh, design advice request with the um, earthquake ready Burnside Bridge team, and um, I think it's worth noting that this it was a very um, energized discussion. Um, I think the two commissions really came together and came out of that DAR with a, a with a quite a bit of um, unanimity about what probably should happen design-wise with the bridge. Um, just to hit a couple of the highlights of that, uh, a lot of the discussion revolved around the, really the differences between the two sides of the river, right? The west side being the historic uh, land, landmark Old Town District, and the east side really having this more dynamic 
development occurring at, at the east end of the bridge. And so um, I think the resulting design advice to the team was to treat the west side um, with a with a girder style structure that didn't create any overhead um, elements that might sort of impact that the low scale of the historic district um, or block the views say to the to the white stag sign and then that the east side could you know could could celebrate a little bit more with a cable stayed towers that that really reflected the dynamic nature of what's what's taking place on the on the east side of the river. Um, and then, of course, because the current bridge has a, a bascule operation in the middle, uh, it, the, the group felt it was appropriate to maintain that as the as the method of operation of the bridge. Next slide. Um, and to wrap up the sustainability and resilience piece, I just wanted to point your attention to a very recent report that came out of the American Institute of Architects, uh, which um, is is uh, it's 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 sort of a, a a landmark point in time. They've been tracking the proportion of the design and construction industry that is related to existing buildings versus new construction, and for the first time. Uh, the 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 economic activity in design and construction related to existing buildings has actually eclipsed that of new buildings and i think there are some very good reasons for that a lot of which have to do with um economics and certainly um, um you know climate change and carbon uh issues about carbon emissions um and so just a reminder that the built environment generates somewhere between 40 and 50% of annual global carbon dioxide emissions. And I think the bottom line here is that in order for us to achieve carbon neutrality, I think achieving that is directly tied to incentivizing reuse and retrofit of existing structures. And I'll pass it over to Kristen for our awards. Wonderful, thanks. We just have two more slides here. Um, the topic of sustainability is a really great lead in to the first of our two annual awards. We recognize um, one new build project and one outstanding retrofit project every year. And the Montgomery Park project um, has the potential to transform the surrounding neighborhood. It is a nine story building. Um, I'm sure you all know it well, if you've lived in Portland. Um, it was a warehouse for uh, Montgomery Ward and company, and it had it, its own railroad spur even into the building. And then, um, let's see, closed in 1982 and was redeveloped into offices. And now Unico Properties, um, along with GBD Architects, are altering all of the lower floors to add retail and restaurant uses and a, a new beautiful uh, central atrium you can see here in this image. Um, the building is on the National Register and it will retain all of its beautiful and functional steel sash windows. Uh, next slide. Great. Um, and our new build award this year, um, to be honest, was, was also a contender for a rehabilitation award because this project does both. <laughs> Um, the oldest buildings of the Anna Mann home, um, it was built as, a, as an old age home, um, date from I think 1911, and then there were new wings added in the 50s and later than that. Um, and then we asked the well-known affordable housing developer, Innovative Housing Inc., um, to be one of our invited speakers. So I, I don't, I, I'm not gonna 
say too much more about this excellent project, but it does very sensitively add several new freestanding buildings to the site um, while observing a very strict budget. So we want to thank and congratulate Emmerich Architects and to uh, Julie Garver at IHI. And that concludes, um, next slide, um, our presentation. Very good, thank you, excellent presentation. And do you have any invited testimony? We do, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and uh, facilitate that for us. And while, while I've got the mic, uh, Megan, do we have any other public testimony? We have two people. Okay, why don't we go ahead and start with the uh, invited testimony, Kristen, then we'll go to uh, the open testimony. Very good. Um, we have four people who um, were here to provide invited testimony, but I am not sure one of them was able to make it today. So um, we have Nicole Possert, um, maybe Kim Brown, although I'm not seeing her yet. Um, we have Ong Peng, and then we have Julie Garber. So let's start with um, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Hello, Mayor, and uh, thank you, uh, Chair Miner, Mayor, and Commissioners. Um, my name is Nicole Possert. I'm the Executive Director of Restore Oregon. As the only statewide nonprofit dedicated to historic pr preservation, our mission is to preserve, reuse, and pass forward the places and spaces that reflect our state's diverse cultural heritage. I would also be remiss if I didn't take this brief opportunity to say thank you to each one of you for the adoption of the Historic Resources Code Project, a major success this year for the city of Portland, including the amendment that strengthened the demolition criteria. That amendment will have a measurable positive impact for decades to come. So thank you for that. There is so much that historic preservation can do to help address the city's most pressing needs. And, but my testimony today is just gonna focus on two topics, the legacy businesses and climate resiliency. To date, we have not prioritized supporting and celebrating cultural heritage embedded in legacy businesses, especially women owned or minority owned businesses. Restore Oregon is currently developing a model for a statewide legacy business program. And at a time when so many have closed and those that remain face tremendous challenges, we believe a legacy business program can set the stage for a new type of preservation, one that supports living history while also preserving and celebrating our collective heritage. And we support the Landmarks Commission and staff's work and would be delighted to partner in any possible way to make that a reality here in Portland. Next is climate resiliency. Historic preservation can be a significant and effective tool in the carbon reduction goals our planet requires. Reuse of older buildings, designated historic or not, can help the city reach its carbon reduction goals much faster than demolishing and building new. Restore Oregon commissioned Eco Northwest to understand the carbon cost of demolition. The study concluded that Portland's residential and commercial demolitions represent approximately four and a half percent of the city's total annual carbon reduction goal. That's significant. Through reuse and efficiency improvements in existing buildings, historic preservation has a major role to play in stemming climate change. How do these two topics link together? Well, places like the Billy Webb Elks Lodge in Albina. Restore Oregon is currently working hand in hand with the dedicated volunteer, volunteer leadership there. The lodge is a legacy business. It operates in a historic building. That building is undergoing repair and reuse, not demolition, after a devastating fire. It will be preserved and made more climate resilient. In conclusion, I ask today that the uh, mayor and commissioners please try to prioritize finding financial resources for historic preservation, funding for more staff, funding for the cultural resources plan, funding for the updated inventory, and of course, funding for legacy businesses. Restore Oregon stands ready to be a partner 
and a collaborator. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, it looks like um, Kim Brown has not been able to make it today. She's with able to, I'm sorry, Kristen, to interrupt, but I was able to um, okay. connect with her and she said she didn't get the link. And so ah. if you, <clears throat> somebody wants to send her the link, she, she could participate. But. Okay, I will. Um, I'll. We'll, let's move on and see if um, perhaps she can. She can get on. It would be great to hear from her. Um, but Jordan um, is here, a um, master's candidate from University of Oregon. Thank you so much, Jordan. Thank you, Commissioner Miner, and thank you, Mayor Wheeler, and distinguished commissioners of Portland City Council, for giving me this opportunity to testify. My name is Jordan Bine. I'm a graduate student, historic preservation student at the University of Oregon. I originally came from Burma, Myanmar, a country from in Southeast Asia, to study historic preservation as a Fulbright scholar. I've been a Portland resident proudly for almost two years now. First, I would like to recognize with gratitude for this annual preservation report by Portland Historic Landmark Commission and the efforts to bring equity and diversity through preservation. These two incredible years in Portland and my graduate program repeatedly reminded me to address diversity in communities that we historically failed to recognize and engage with underrepresented communities to make more inclusive high level decisions. As a Chinese Burmese, I feel disheartened to walk down the empty and unsafe old town Chinatown, which was once a vibrant area with businesses. I'm thrilled to welcome Old Town 90 Day Recovery plan, and I strongly believe the legacy business program that the commission proposed will elevate the efforts concurrently. Legacy business program is more than su supporting food businesses, but here I would like to give an emphasis on them. As a Portland resident, we take pride in our small businesses and local food culture. Today, almost all the restaurants in Old Town Chinatown could not survive the pandemic and on ongoing neighborhood challenges with um, rising rent. Those businesses end up moving away or closure, and those legacy business were once the reason that we visit Portland Chinatown. Another aspect that I would like to highlight from my graduate research is about the Federal Historic Tax Credit Program. My project title is to identify types of barriers to utilizing historic tax credit program in Oregon from developers perspective. Unlike other states, my research found Oregon has a relatively low utilization rate and ranked 38 among other states in terms of part two application received for the past decades. And that is on average eight application approved for part two per year. Since 1981, 45% of projects in Oregon are outside of Portland, which means the total expenditures were less than $1.2 million. These small projects and rural developers generally face more um, economic and financial obstacles in rehabilitation, such as access to capital, finding tax credit partnership, et cetera. One of the recommendations that I have from my research is to adopt state historic tax credits, like 39 other states, to accelerate historic tax credit program in Oregon. And I, I, I and bring invest, uh, private investment to those rural and mainstream communities. I firmly, firmly believe as a preservationist, we can use preservation as a tool to solely solve timely issues of economic division, racial equality, cultural division, and most importantly, housing crisis. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Um, lastly, we have Julie Garver from IHI. And if the council clerk doesn't mind bringing the presentation back up, the last three slides um, are for Julie's remarks. Well, I'll, uh, I'll start talking while the slides are being brought up. I wanna thank you for uh, the invite today, uh, Mayor and Council, Landmarks Commission and staff. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we are excited to, uh, to talk about historic preservation and affordable housing. Uh, next slide, please. 
So as uh, many of you know, innovative housing has a little bit of a soft spot for historic buildings and affordable housing. We have rehabbed several buildings in the central Portland area. And this is a, just a little snapshot of a few of my favorite uh, photographs to look at today. Uh, the top right is Musop Manor, which was the old Foster Hotel. As you can see, the storefronts were in rough shape on this building. And so we were able to salvage many pieces while doing a full seismic upgrade on that building. Uh, when I was uh, first came to Innovative Housing in 2006, the pictures below that, the Modern Rich Hotel, this is a, a neat little historic building at Cooch and Second. And I appreciated what, what I think Kim was saying earlier about some uh, modest historic uh, buildings. You know, they don't have to be the fanciest or, or the most expensive sometimes to really create uh, some, some great preservation and affordable housing opportunities. And so we remodeled the Modern Rich in 2012. And then there's the historic photo of, uh, of what it was like way back when. And then on the lower left is the Erickson Fritz on, uh, on 2nd Avenue, right, right off of Burnside. And this gives you an idea of the, the courtyard area while the building was under construction or rehab in 2015, and then the finished courtyard area after Rehab. So all three of these projects are in, you know, active, affordable housing use, as well as the Clifford Apartments in Central Southeast, the Whitmarsh uh, downtown, and uh, and as we were just talking about the the Anna Mann House, which is under construction, and uh, and we'll see some pictures about that next. But I wanted to talk a little bit about why affordable housing in. Uh, historic buildings is such a great idea and, um, and why it's, we appreciate everybody's efforts on this so much. It, first of all, it really provides a different living experience, a different feeling of home for uh, families that are looking for affordable housing. A lot of times when affordable housing is built, it's, it's kind of looks the same sometimes, not to put too fine a point on it. But this really gives uh, residents a different feeling. When we just finished the Erickson Hotel, I was there to, to look at something in the building. And one of the people that lived on that courtyard was standing outside and she was just looking up and we got to chatting and, and, uh, and she found out what I did. And she said, why did you make it so nice? Why did you, why did you put all this money in there when you knew that we were gonna be living here? And man, that just about broke my heart, but I just, I. I took a minute and said, you know, every everybody really deserves a, a safe and nice place to live. And so it really gives residents the opportunity to have a, a different feeling of home. And then um, quickly, it really, this work really allows for um, facilities to be updated in a full way. So all of these facilities that we have done have been seismically upgraded and, um, and their utilities have been upgraded and affordable housing combining with historic tax credits just really gives you a, a robust budget to, to redevelop these buildings. And sometimes historic buildings, it's hard to find the money to do it in a robust way, especially the seismic portion. And then finally, we think it's really important to do this work because it combats the perception that preserving historic buildings is really only an attempt to prevent diversity or an attempt to stop change. So we believe that historic buildings are for everyone and our work really brings in that diverse uh, group of folks into these buildings. Next slide, please. And then in closing, I just wanted to give you a little snapshot of what's going on at the Anna Mann project. Um, as, uh, as was discussed earlier, this is an awesome project that City Council, Portland Housing Bureau, Landmarks, everyone at the city has really been supporting uh, its uh, work. This is going to provide 128 units of affordable housing 
on a 3.14 acre site. And so these pictures give you an idea of what's going on. The one on the left is an, a small excavator that we brought inside the Anna Mann house to dig trenches to put in new plumbing lines. It has all new, uh, all new plumbing, electrical, heating, the new framing of the units inside the Anna Mann house. On the far right, that's a foundation of the south building, the new building that's going in. The lower right photo is an old auditorium that was built in 1993, and we're gonna change these into six two bedroom townhouses, which is gonna have a really neat feel. I can't wait for you guys to come on a tour and see it. And then the last photo on the lower left is the new construction East building. And so Animan is going to be a wonderful asset for the neighborhood, for families who are living here, it really increased the density of this area, which is in Laurelhurst and Kearns, and it's very close to a lot of great amenities in Hollywood transit. We're preserving the National Register building. And so we just can't say enough thank yous to all city staff <laughs> that have been putting up with all of our high needs on, hey, we don't really fit the square, uh, square peg in the round hole of everything city related and so people have really been helping us out. So thanks very much for, for the nice award on this project and for everyone's support. And yeah, I can't wait for y'all to see the finished product. Okay, and uh, I understand that Kim Brown has been able to join us. So we do have one more invited testimony Right. I can. Hello. Sorry. Hi, Hello. Hi. Um, I'm sorry. I wasn't here from the beginning, so I just I'm trying. I'm kind of all over the place. I take care of my mom who has Alzheimer's, so please forgive me but um i am here to support the legacy program to help my family business and now with that we have the access to resources for repairing our building other than that that's all i have to say and thank you for your support because we're super excited about being a national historic site <laughs> kim thank you and uh, we totally understand uh the situation uh, you, you you're obviously doing the great work of taking care of your mom that's, that's terrific. And thank you for, for juggling your schedule today. Uh, that's important too. So thank you. Thanks for thank your, you. on the commission. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I just wanna thank the uh, commission for that fabulous report. And I did not wanna leave Matthew hanging who actually put a challenge question out there to me around uh, whether or not there was any plans moving forward around the um, unreinforced masonry buildings. And, and the answer to that question is not at the moment, but if there are federal funds that become available to do the kind of retrofit necessary, then we will have the necessary bureaus look for those dollars but at this moment, no. Uh, you may notice that there's been a couple of other crises we've been responding to over the last couple of years, but I do think uh, we will need to take a more thoughtful approach and the original one just wasn't the right approach at the right time and with no resources. So um, not yet, but it's on the list. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, and, um... Uh, Megan, you said there were a couple of people who signed up on the open list. Let's hear from them as well. Three minutes each name for the record. The first is Wendy Rahm. Here. So Hi, I Wendy. had so much fun the last time that I thought I'd come back, but where are you all? We're, we're all around Ryan you. Is, <laughs> Commissioner Ryan is here. <laughs> Uh, I'm Wendy Rahm, and I'm vice chair of the Downtown Neighborhood Association. Uh, the DNA recommends City Council approve the acceptance, acceptance of this thorough, thoughtful report. The All-Volunteer Commission has done an extraordinary amount of work this year, and as a fellow volunteer, I'm grateful. 
we strongly urge council to support the creation of a cultural resources plan and to fully fund the update of the 1984 historic resource inventory, which is truly long overdue and exacerbates structural inequities. Funding this update will allow for discovering and listing areas and resources related to diverse groups long overlooked. It will also help prevent displacement and ongoing loss of community cohesion. To tell a more inclusive story requires money. Only funding by city council will correct the inequities and identify important resources that are disappearing fast. We also stress the importance of continuing the COVID discontinued exploratory process to incentivize seismic up upgrades as soon as possible, Commissioner Hardesty. <laughs> Um, downtown small businesses and owners of older buildings need assistance to do this critical work. And this older building stock offers affordable office space and affordable housing, in addition to giving Portland a sense of, of place for tourists and those of us who live here. Finally, we appreciate the watch list, which includes two items that matter enormously to the DNA. One is downtown itself, uh, which must be a focal point for recovery. And the second is the Landmark Commission emphasis on treating the Thompson Elk Fountain as a single work of art to be restored and returned to its original site. We appreciate the ordinance recently passed by you, all of you, um, but its language is contradicted by the give us three options language of the RFP issued by uh, Parks Foundation. This is a cause for concern. So please endorse the Elk Fountain restoration and return it to Main Street as recommended by this report in the Landmark Commission. Thank you very much. Next we have Lejeune Thorson. Good afternoon. I'm Lejeune Thorson, member of the Downtown Neighborhood Association and resident of downtown. What I have to say is simple and brief. I'm here to support refurbishing and returning the Thompson Elk with its fountain as a single work of public art to its original place of prominence on Main Street. Returning this beautiful piece of public art is symbolic of our making it through these difficult last few years together. Thank you for recognizing the importance of this symbol to the citizens of Portland. Let's celebrate the return of our beautiful city. Thank you. Jordan to the point, thank you. Megan, does that complete the public testimony? Yes, it does. All right, well, that was a great presentation and uh, well done. And at the end of a very long council day and it was compelling and well thought out and the presentations was fa were fantastic. Uh, colleagues, are there any further questions? And if not, of course, I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. Commissioner Hardesty moves. Can I get a second, please? Sure, second. Commissioner Ryan seconds. And before I call the roll, colleagues, I also just want to acknowledge Commissioner Rubio did reach out to me and reminded me that she represents the City Council on MPAC. Uh, the Metro Policy Advisory Commission, and uh, she was required to go to that meeting. So she, she did not want anybody to think that that meant she did not overwhelmingly support the great work that you've all done. It's just she can't be two places simultaneously, uh, despite everybody's efforts to try to do that these days. Uh, so without further ado, Megan, please call the roll. Ryan. Thank you so much, commissioners. That was a great report. Sorry, it's a little bit late. I really, um, I wanna acknowledge just a few things, especially that the Anna Man. I'm glad that you spent some time on that and brought that back to the dais. I think too often we, we pit historic preservation against affordable housing and the only way to, uh, we need stories that are real like this one to, um, to kill that myth. So, um, you know, I'm glad that you've been so adamant uh, in support of that. I'm really proud that the, that's um, under construction. I look forward to watching it along the way. It's one of those projects that you wanna go a couple times during mid-construction because it's so fascinating. And uh, I just really wanted to call that out in particular. 
And of course, I'm really excited about the Thompson elk um, being restored fully, and I'm glad that you're on board with that. You know, it's so important, the work that you do and the amount of hours that you put into it, and you really do cover the details that we all need to hear about. And it's not lost on me that the two reports we had today were obviously very complimentary. And it's at a time where a city, I think, needs to keep taking a collective breath and uh, really lean into cultural hi history as well. And I'm really happy to see that we're leaning into more projects that restore um, communities that have often been left behind. So the <clears throat> dialogue you're having earlier with Commissioner Hardesty about Vanport, I look forward to working with her and Commissioner Rubio to take that further. Today, we also had a proclamation about Vanport as it's uh, the history of Vanport, of course, as the Memorial Day flood way back when. And uh, we, we um, anyway, so there's a lot of timeliness to bringing that to the dais today as well. Mostly I just wanted to look at all of you and say thank you for all the time you put into this. Your volunteer work is, um, I think I once asked Kristen Minor how much um, time she put into this and she was quite humble, but I was a little overwhelmed. It reminded me of what it was like to be on the school board. So anyway, I really appreciate all of you for your service to the city. I accept this report, aye. Hardesty. It is clear you bring passion to your volunteer role on this commission. And I hate to be the wet blanket in the room because you had some very specific asks of us that are not going to be resolved by us accepting this report today. And so I, I say today your work begins. You've told us what you want. Now you've got to figure out how to get us interested in giving it to you. Um, uh, and of course, no one gets everything they want because we don't have unlimited money. Um, I will say that you have raised some issues that you've raised every year for the three years I've been here. Um, and the timing is really impeccable. As we start imagining what life will be like after COVID and who will come back from COVID and what the culture of the city will be, um, your volunteer hours will be critical in us figuring out how we invest limited resources in a way that really will benefit all Portlanders um, from a whole host of backgrounds. And what I know is that we will need different tools for different communities because many communities' uh, histories have been washed away and we call that urban renewal. And we do that over and over and over again. So, uh, so we will have to be creative and thoughtful um, I accept this report in the spirit and the hard work that you created it, um, but I will say that this is just the beginning. We really need a plan if, if your work will become reality, um, and, and we don't have that yet. So I look forward to continuing to work with you so that you will see your report reflected in budget decisions that come down the pipe that really are intentional about where we're moving and who's moving there with us and how equitable we will be as the city once we get there. So I'm happy to vote aye to accept the report today. Thank you. Maps. Um, and I join my colleagues in thanking the uh, Portland uh, Historic Land uh, Marks Commission for this report and your hard work over the past year. I also want to recognize and thank the um, other speakers who um, shared their thoughts with us today. You've given us a lot to chew on. Um, and this report couldn't be more timely. Um, we started this morning by uh, declaring um, Vanport Day of Remembrance, which is a reminder that even as our city grows and evolves, we should remember and preserve the past. Um, and I think you've given us many ideas and many plans for moving forward on that project. Um, I wanna say I very much support um, your call for us to make progress on our historic resources in, uh, inventory. Um, I don't see how we can uh, make meaningful progress until we get that basic work done. Um, I also wanna say how um, reassured uh, I am to see the consensus and dialogue happen between the Historic Landmarks Commission and the D Design Commission 
around the next Burnside Bridge um, as a policymaker. That gives me um, some peace of mind as we um, get closer to making a huge investment, which will um, be with our city for um, a century. And I also want to take a moment um, to recognize some of the buildings that you recognize. Uh, the Montgomery Park, uh, which is rehabilitation project of the year. I believe a couple of years ago, I got a briefing on that, got to tour the site. Uh, really is great, very excited about that. Also wonderful to see the progress and recognition for new building project of the year at a man house. Um, also great to see. Also another win for Commissioner Ryan. Uh, um, I know he has worked hard to actually bring uh, that project forward. So great work, everybody. I love to see the collaboration um, between the um, Landmarks Commission and uh, so many other groups in this council. And I look forward to working with you as we head into budget season to figure out how we can make progress on some of the important ideas that you put on the table. Uh, for these reasons and more, I am glad to vote aye and accept this report. Wheeler. I want to thank everybody who had anything to do with this report today. I thought it was great. I appreciated not only the presentations and the organization, but as well, uh, I appreciated the public testimony and the thoughtful comments we received. This is great work, important subject. I thank you for your continued volunteerism and your leadership. And I'm very happy to stand with my colleagues to support this report. I vote aye, the report is accepted. And believe it or not, colleagues, I think we're actually done for the day. Uh, Megan, thank you for, for the great work you did. We are adjourned. Recording stop.